The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. The following show is brought to you in part by Not Me in Arlington, Massachusetts. Not Me is a nonprofit organization with a mission to promote, advance, and unify self defense education and training for at risk populations. Visit Not Me at www.not-me.org. Hello, Viewpoint listeners. This is BaseNet Internet Television National Political Correspondent Tony Mizuko coming to you with Episode 16 of Viewpoint. And I'm here tonight with our producer and director of programming and my perennial guest, Ed Jupin. Ed, how are you tonight? I'm fine, Tony. Perennial guest for hopefully a couple more weeks or something anyway. Yes, we are actively pursuing leads into a new co-host. Uh, not that we have a problem with Ed, but we'd like to get some other opinions Mo- on here. Moving on and upward to bigger and better things, considering I have about four or five other shows to work on, including, as we've mentioned in the past, the relaunching of our flagship video show, After Dark, with Alice and Lee, that we're actually in the studio now recording. So my hands are a little tied here. I'm stretching myself a little too thin. So if you're a Viewpoint listener out there, you don't have to agree to be the co-host for every single episode, but if you want to come on and do just an episode with us, even a short little segment, hey, let us know, email us, Facebook us, tweet us, Google plus us. I don't know how that works, but Google plus us. And uh, get in touch with us, and we'd love to have you on the show. Without further ado, we're going to jump right into some of the news for the evening that we're going to talk about, mainly because we did bye week here. The first item we're going to talk about, ladies and gentlemen, what has everyone been saying about Wawa Gate? Actually, let me give you a quick rundown of tonight's lineup. First, we're going to talk about Wawa Gate. We're going to talk about Wawa Gate. Is yep. Wawa Gate anything to do with that little um, like convenience store in the New Jersey area? And I know, there I go, plugging New Jersey again. So I guess yep. I have to yep. send my bill to the uh, fine governor. But yep. uh, Wawa is a uh, chain of like 7-Elevens in the New Jersey area. Yep, they, they are. They're all around, actually. And that's exactly what we are talking about. And next, Oh, we're gonna, good. Next, I haven't heard about Wawa Gate. Oh, with, forward with, to this. with Mitt Romney and Wawa Gate, you haven't heard yet? No, I guess I've been living under a rock. Whoa. See, I told you, I'm just way too busy these days. All right, then we're going to talk about Fast and Furious Gate, and then we're going to talk about the FCC Decision Gate. All right, the last one's really Whoa, not a, a lot of gates today. They're all gates. For whatever reason, controversies are gates in this country, so this is going to be the Great Gates episode. But we're going to go right into Wawa Gate now. I guess you could call it NBC Gate because whatever you're talking about, actually, no, I guess Wawa Gate would be an appropriate title because going back to Watergate, the Watergate, which was one word, by the way, it wasn't water, then gate. It was the Watergate Hotel or office complex. It, it, whatever precedes the gate is usually not the problem. It just happens to be there, it happens to be where the gate took place. And this took place at a Wawa, which is a convenience store, deli, sub shop type chain. And they don't have any in Massachusetts, but they are in New Jersey and elsewhere. NP- NBC, not NPC, sorry, NBC is actually the fault here. What happened is Mitt Romney went in to a Wawa. He was being filmed, the media was with him, as always. It was a campaign stop. He started telling a story about a doctor. I forget what kind of doctor it was. It's not relevant to the story, but one of those more complicated names that I can never seem to remember. But he's telling the story about this doctor who was talk- telling him about how he wanted to get his local address changed with the post office. And how many times he had to talk to the post office, how many people he had to talk to, how many forms he filled out, and how much bureaucracy there was just to get his address changed. And Mitt Romney's idea, what he was talking about was how the private sector is much more efficient. He said, hey, look at this. Look at Wawa. I come in and, you know, oh, look, I hand this to the cashier. I hit a couple buttons. He hits a couple buttons. And wow, we're all done. It, It takes two seconds. Now, that was him making fun of government bureaucracy. What NBC did is, and they're completely ignoring this, by the way, I have a feeling that if they do not backtrack and issue a stronger apology, you're going to see some permanent bad blood between the Romney campaign and uh, NBC. And I think if he gets in the White House, it's going to hurt them. But anyway, they issued an unedited, excuse me, an edited ad that didn't show the preceding discussion he had about government bureaucracy. And it just showed Mitt Romney going, wow, I walk in here. And I pick what I want, and I pay the cashier. I hit a couple buttons. He hits a couple buttons. I think it was one of those self-checkout type things. He's like, and we're done. And it made it look as if Romney was amazed 
that kind of technology existed, and it made him look out of touch. It, it well, of course, what... here we go back to my old Howard Dean story again. The media tends to just clip the soundbite very, very short, and they leave out the most important part of the soundbite. This was bad, though. This was worse than, I mean, this was almost, it is, I'd say it's about as bad, although not as serious, of course, as with the Zimmerman and the Trayvon shooting and what they did there, packing up his statement. But this goes beyond them just showing uh, you know, the key points. It completely changed the way it was perceived. It completely changed the meaning. I mean, there's being taken out of context, and then there's blatantly lying. And that's what NBC did. And the Romney campaign was pissed because it made him – it would appear that he's out of touch. That, you know, and obviously the left wants to paint Mitt Romney as, you know, this rich out of touch guy. He was actually making a funny statement in a story that most people, I think, would understand that why is it so difficult when you want to – pay your taxes, you want to change your address with the post office, you want to, you know, do one simple thing, figure out how much you owe on your federal student loan, and it's this long, complicated process, but you can go into a convenience store and just buy something and walk right out. Mitt Romney's campaign was upset, and NBC has not issued an apology. They issued one of those small, you didn't intend to deceive anyone's statements, but I think this might continue to grow because it's indefensible on NBC's part, you know, and they're saying it's Peacock Pride and NBC doesn't want to admit that they were wrong and come back. And that's fine. But let's be honest, it's just wrong. And it goes above and beyond. They've been calling it Wawa Gate. I think the controversy is going to die as time goes on because NBC is just ignoring it and wants nothing to do with it. But I think that they just cost their stockholders some money because Mitt Romney's not likely to forget this. It harkens back to... George H.W. Bush in the late 80s when he was in he was legitimately amazed at a grocery scanner whereas Mitt Romney was just making a joke about something similar and it made George H.W. Bush seem out of touch which he probably was although in 1989 I don't know Ed maybe you can tell me how new were uh, barcode scanners in 1989 oh, yeah definitely a modern miracle I don't actually I don't even think they were around in 1989 yet so that was early, definitely the uh, infancy stage yeah they were still relatively new and at this point George H.W. Bush had already been vice president for eight years he had been head of the CIA been the US representative to the UN so my guess is many many years before that before he actually shopped for himself mm -hmm. But again, here's a case, and I don't think Mitt Romney does his own shopping, let's be honest there, we all know that. Yeah. It was just a dirty trick on the part of NBC, and I'd say shame on NBC. We can't have stuff like this influencing our elections. If you would just watch that ad, you would think, oh, look at this guy, he's amazed at, you know, a self-checkout. What's wrong with him? A completely, I don't even want to say missing the context, I want to say abusing the context, lying about the context. It was just awful. I think it's going to become more... Time goes on for NBC. Well, I know I said earlier, I think it's going to go away. I think under the... I think mainstream media is burying this, as mainstream media would tend to watch out for each other. Because as wrapped up in the news cycle as I tend to be, I've really not heard much about this at all. Yeah. They're, they're, you got to check it out, look it up. Because it's you're right, they're they're trying to bury it. They don't want to know what's going on because they don't want more scrutiny on themselves. And I think a lot of them are very left leaning, and they do want to punish Mitt Romney. They don't want to have him win the election in 2012. And you know that might sound like a simplistic statement coming from me, but you know well, what? Well, you know, regardless of regardless of what any of those either cable or over the air broadcast networks want to admit, unlike Basenet, where we. We're more than happy to tell people where we stand or That's... even or even where we stand individually, if not representing the company of BaseNet as a whole. We know that all, almost all of these networks lean left, with the exception of Fox. And ironically, Fox is the one that comes out and says, oh, no, we don't lean right. We're definitely fair and balanced, as their slogan goes, and we're right down the middle. But come on, they lean further to the right than some of the other networks lead to the left, but yet they're still kind of being the most honest about it. Yeah, so, you know, I don't that's, know. That's true. I think the difference between Fox and some of the other networks, I don't think Fox's news coverage, per se, tends to lean to the right. Most of their shows are conservative shows. Though. The shows are, right. I mean, hey, and maybe that's because that, that's what sells. And I think history has proven that's what sells. Al, Al Gore's Air America and, and the, the TV liberal network, their TV one or whatever, they failed miserably. Of course, so, I mean, and why is Rush Limbaugh 
a gazillionaire. Come on. Exactly. You know, so I think they're just making a business. That's the thing. I think Fox is making a business decision. I don't think they really say we want to be right wing and we want to sell. But Fox News has the highest ratings. Oh, by far. So, you know, exactly. I mean, they're, so, they're like four times higher than the closest competitor. Exactly. So they're very intelligent with what they do. But again, I, I don't think they present right wing media bias per se in their news coverage if you were to watch the station i mean bill o'reilly bounces around but he's you know he's to the right sean hannity's a self-avowed conservative i mean there's no he's line the furthest that. to the right on the whole network exactly you know and he he pulls it quite a bit to the right i mean fox news did have glenn beck on every day for a couple hours a day for quite a while so their their non-news coverage is definitely i wouldn't even say right-leaning it's right-wing i don't mean that in a bad way it's conservative however you want to say it but i think that nbc by doing something like this and this wasn't one of their shows this was their news coverage which is a difference i think that's where they're getting into a trap and where it's really wrong and where that bias comes through but you know what ultimately like we said a few minutes ago they're not getting the ratings they're losing losing the viewership, and I don't know, how relevant is NBC News coming from now on? How often do people come home and say, time to watch the NBC Nightly News? It's just not happening anymore. So their model's dying out, and then, you know what? If they're going to continue to do things like this, their model should die out, and so should they. That is Wawagate. I encourage you all, Google it. It is already showing up under as a Google search term. Don't let Wawagate die as we move on to Fast and Furious Gate, or perhaps we could call it Executive Privilege Gate, or Contempt Gate. There's a lot of gates here. I'm going to give a quick little background update on this, just so everyone can refresh their memory. Fast and Furious was a program by the Department of Justice where, and I'm sure at some point this looked good on paper, I won't criticize them for that, they would sell or give, flood the market, however they do it, weapons, guns, to drug cartels, in an effort to trace those guns back to the cartel leadership. And I don't know how they exactly trace them, but I think they, you know, they're able to follow the clues. They capture a gun at a raid somewhere in Mexico or Guatemala, and they can say, okay, this is one of ours. We know what left here, and then we traded here, and they, they can find out where everyone's going, what everyone's doing. Again, I'm sure on paper it sounded like a great idea. However, yeah, it was all well and good until one of those guns came back to kill a border patrol agent. <laughs> exactly, and that's that's what happened that started this. There was a border agent. He was a young man by the name of Ed. Do you remember? No. Okay. The uh, interestingly enough, the White House press secretary was chastised recently for not remembering the name of the border agent killed in Fast and Furious. Well, I'm not the White House press agent. Right. Well, Brian Terry is his name for those of you out there. But I, I almost want to give the White House press secretary a pass because let's be honest, Ed, you didn't remember it. I didn't remember it uh, often before I started looking back in the story. And I know it sounds awful. I feel awful for the man. But the amount of information the White House press secretary probably has to keep in his head. Oh, I'm surprised the guy can remember his own name. Absolutely. But anyway, so there's actually an article pops up. It says, Doe, White House forgets slain agent's name. It's awful. But I mean, let's be honest, a, a lot of other things happen to happen not to diminish his – uh, what happened. But anyway, he was shot to death and the gun, they traced the gun and it was a fast and furious gun. What that means is the United States government, the Department of Justice, purchased firearms, guns, gave them to cartels, and the cartels used that gun to shoot and kill a border agent. That's a little bit of a problem. Now that's bad enough as it is. And if you want my honest opinion, when that first came out, I really think Eric Holder, the attorney general, should have resigned. You're damaging the president, who we all know I don't like, but you're damaging the president by staying in office at that point. Somebody died because of your department's decision. Do I blame Eric Holder personally? No. No, but heads always have to roll. But exactly. Heads have to roll, and you've got to set that example from the top. He should have resigned. But it didn't end there, ladies and gentlemen. It continued to go on. Daryl Issa, a Republican representative who likes to try to subpoena lots of people and subpoenas lots of documents and holds all sorts of hearings, and a lot of them actually go nowhere. So I'm not necessarily defending him, but he has started to look into this, and I believe Lindsey Graham was, or Chuck Grassley was looking into it as well, and, and then Daryl Issa started trying to talk with Holder. And Eric Holder has gone before, before Congress and all that other stuff, and recently... ICE's committee decided to vote to hold Holder, <laughs> hold Holder, in contempt for not providing enough documents, not providing enough answers, and not making himself available enough. 
I'm sure if you read the legality of it, it has to do with the release of documents. The Department of Justice retracted some of their statements as well, which is never a good sign when they make a statement and then they pull them back. And Holder's gone back and forth because early on he was very reluctant to talk to anyone. And then as controversy grew, he moved into it more and then he would pull back and he would move into it more and he would pull back. And I think he's really just playing a game. But what also changed this past week was the president, President Obama, for those of you who are uh, asleep out there, said that the documents that ISA is requesting are covered under executive privilege. Now, what does that mean? What is executive privilege? The best way to describe it would be an understanding, because it's not actually in the Constitution, that the president and his closest staff and advisors are able to exchange documents and information that is not public record, and that does not need to be public record. The idea being, and this goes back to Richard Nixon, that the president has, and I believe the courts have affirmed this to an extent, the president has a right to get advice from advisors without fear that everything's going to get leaked to the press and without fear that information... It goes back further than that. It goes back to at least the Kennedys, you know, with, oh, right. uh, with the baloney going on, you know, back and forth between Bobby and John Kennedy. Right, which somewhat set a precedent, but remember, being brothers, I don't think that made Well, it. yeah, well, that's why after those two, you can't have that anymore. That's the understanding of executive privilege. And as a concept, it makes sense. I mean, the president can't release every memo that's sent to him, every email. I mean, if you've ever worked in an office, if you had to release every idea that came up to your staff and the public right when you came up with the idea, I mean, what would, what would happen then? It just wouldn't function. So there's no problem with that. However... The president is now trying to extend executive privilege to a cabinet agency where we're not really talking about documents in between Eric Holder and the president. Those I can understand being kept confidential as a part of executive privilege. Even if they're emailing back and forth or they're sending memos back and forth, that I can understand keeping apart. But he's trying to say a lot of Eric Holder's documents are subject to executive privilege, and a lot of people are having a problem with that. On Drudge last week, there was a, actually a pitcher, and it was a, a three-tier pitcher. The bottom and the top were uh, Richard Nixon, and then the middle they spliced in, I think it was like Obama's eyes, so you could tell it was Obama matching up with Richard Nixon, who did take executive privilege to a extent that we haven't really seen it since. Now, it's interesting. Nancy Pelosi in this said that she could have had Karl Rove arrested any day, which Karl Rove responded and said was not remotely true. President Obama in 2007 criticized President Bush for using executive privilege with Karl Rove. Now, here's the difference. Karl Rove was chief of staff and or a senior political advisor to the president, not the attorney general. The highest ranking law enforcement officer exactly. in the country. Highest ranking law enforcement, gen a little law enforcement official in the country. That is a constitutional position. Karl Rove didn't have a constitutional position. He was just part of the president's inner staff. If he had moved on to head up a cabinet agency, well, sure, that would be different. But he was the president's staff. That's very wrong. We understand that politics goes back and forth. Everyone blames who's in power for what's going on, and then everyone seems to forget about it. But really, the Obama administration is overstepping their bounds here. That's really quite a stretch to be that critical of the Bush administration, and then to do something that is far, far worse and I have a feeling if this were to go to the courts, in particular the Supreme Court, I have a feeling they would say that executive privilege is A, not very constitutional to begin with, but B, is perhaps the president and his inner circle, maybe a cabinet head in their communications with their senior staff, not as it relates to actual policy, but you're talking about an investigation here. This is very shady territory that the president is moving into. Yeah, it's a, it's a fine line. Where do you draw that fine line or that line in the sand? If inter-office communication went through the pipeline with, gee, are we going to go to McDonald's or Burger King for lunch today, as opposed to, well, who do you think we should sell arms to? Well, I think we kind of know which side of the line in the sand both of those conversations would fall under. But I can what? see where the fine, where the where the gray area would be. Right. You know, then what's covered and what isn't covered. Right. I think where this goes a step forward is you're talking more so about the investigation afterwards. It's not just those back and forth emails. It's right. back and forth emails about a problem that they're investigating. I have a feeling that the longer this goes on, the attorney general is going to unfortunately lose this battle. I wouldn't say he should resign now with so close to the election. It's not going to help. 
unless the controversy grows, then he might have to. But in a sense, he has made it this far. But again, you're you're taking an agency in an institution of the federal government that was held in somewhat high esteem, and now it's not. It's become politicized, and it always has been politicized, but that's been kept under the surface to at least give the appearance that the attorney general is just not as political. But this is really bad. And you know what? It relates to a murdered U.S. border agent, a man with a wife and children, who was murdered with a gun purchased by the United States government, given to Mexican drug cartels. Now, I understand that the government had good intentions with this program, but what is the road to hell paved with good intentions? So I have a feeling this is going to ca- carry on and cause a lot of problems, but the, the, a, the executive privilege and, and the contempt ruling, it's gone to another level that it didn't necessarily need to go to. I hope the president learns a lesson from this, that if he had told the attorney general six months ago, accept responsibility and resign, none of this would be going on. This wouldn't be a controversy. This wouldn't be having a political impact on the president and the very nature of executive privilege in the White House. Because this is going to have impacts beyond just this incident going forward with executive privilege. So I hope President Obama and Attorney General Holder learn their lesson from this. And I hope at some point in time there is justice for Brian Terry's family. I don't know what that justice is going to be, but you know what? It would start with Eric Holder saying, I was the man in charge when this happened. I accept responsibility, and I'm leaving. The other thing to think about, Eric Holder's reputation is being ruined, and he's letting it being ruined. If he had resigned right when this first came out, I mean, you know, after they were pretty sure what happened, he could have had a phenomenal career going forward and said, hey, I was a man of integrity. I stepped down and took responsibility for what happened under my watch. What a great precedent that sets. But no, he didn't do it, and now he's going to be remembered as the bastard who sold guns to Mexican drug cartels that used them to kill a murdered border agent. You you know, a a perfect example of somebody resigning like that is your pal, Richard Nixon. You think back, and some people would want to argue with me over this, but just go back and look at your facts. After he resigned, he laid low for the better part of a decade. Through the 80s into the 90s, I believe he died around 94 or so, from the 80s into the 90s when he passed away, he became the elder statesman of his party. People actually went back to him again for his opinion and so on and so forth. So, you know, he resigned. He resigned in disgrace. He still ultimately, a decade later, became the elder statesman of his party. He did, and you know... He was redeemed in the eyes of a lot of people. They, they had moved past it. They had forgiven him because when you objectively looked at Wall, Watergate, what the president had done, yes, was wrong. But, I mean, nobody died because of it. Yeah. And it was all political shenanigans. And I think people begin to realize that. Fun little fact. I have visited the Richard Nixon presidential library and birthplace three times. <laughs> I have been to the museum three times. I will not go to Southern California without visiting it. But I think you're right. He stood up. And you know what? Even if people say he only did it so he didn't get impeached, he still had the courage to say, I'm going to resign and not put the country through this, no matter how much he was involved, invested That's in That's right. Because at that point in time, he could have made those proceedings drag on and on and on. They may not have found anything. And he could have stayed in power. Most people can't give up power, and Richard Nixon did. Yeah, he was, he was halfway through his second term already at that point. Right, but he still willingly gave up the presidency of the United States. Who does that? I think it takes a man of greater character than people were willing to give Richard Nixon credit for. That's a great, great uh, point that you brought up there. But you're right, he stepped down. He resigned, and he ultimately he said, hey, this made it to the presidency. It wasn't as big of a deal as I initially – it's a bigger deal than I initially thought it was. It's time for me to resign. Ronald Reagan with Iran-Contra, he didn't resign, but he apologized to the country. He openly apologized and said, hey, I screwed up, not in those exact words, but I didn't think this was what it was. I'm not stepping down, but I apologize. I was wrong here. I was at fault, however you wanted to phrase it. He accepted responsibility, and that's not what the attorney general is doing in this case. He's not accepting any responsibility. You know, even a couple of months ago, if he had not resigned but openly accepted responsibility and apologized... I almost think that that would have been a, you know, they would have given him a pass. People might have still called for his head, but then the president could have said, look, look, you know, you can't have the attorney general 
resigning over every bad program because there's so many of them, blah, blah, blah. He apologized. He accepted responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. So where do we stand now? There were just congressional hearings against him. Correct? Yeah, I think they're going to try to uh, subpoena him and hold him in contempt of Congress. I don't know if that's going to happen because the committee has held him in contempt. The entire House voting to hold him in contempt is going to be a little bit more difficult to do. And to the extent the Senate then gets involved, I, I don't really remember the process, but that would be unlikely to happen. Mainly, it's a big political battle, and it's, it's you know, dragging your opponent through the mud, but the House may want to focus on other things. What might help Holder get away with this is when the Supreme Court announces, which they will shortly, decisions on health care and the Arizona immigration law. That could just sort of blow this out of the water. However, I'm going to paint a little scenario for you here. Hypothetically, the Supreme Court upholds the Arizona immigration law, shuts down Obamacare, Republicans in the House might go for a trifecta and try to hold the uh, attorney general in contempt to deal as much damage to the uh, administration as possible. But this is this is certainly... I actually think it's easier to uh, hold him in contempt of Congress than you're making it out to be. You know, it might be... I guess what my concern is is that they're... It, depending on how Obamacare and the Arizona immigration law are... Congress might start focusing on other things and the country might focus on other things and he might get away with it. I'll tell you one thing, though. If the Supreme Court strikes down the Arizona immigration law and upholds Obamacare, I would guarantee that they're going to move full forward to try to hang Holder. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, because they're, they're going to, you know, they lost their trifecta. So at that point, they exactly. have to get one of them anyway. Court. You know, if they get one of the two, it'll all depend, you know, and it'll get into the complexity. I think it could happen, but it depends on what they also have going on on their plate. They're also getting into election season now. They may, it depends, they may be more apt to want to take it on in election season. You'll see representatives in those areas be more apt to take it on, but other people who maybe live in a mixed district or are in a more moderate district might not want to start attacking the attorney general. They might want to try to focus on the election or whatnot. But some Democrats who, again, maybe live in working class neighborhoods or blue dog Democrats, whatever we want to call these Democrats, there's always a different term for them. You know, where they have a moderate base, whatnot, or maybe a Republican leading district, they may be willing to jump on board to do it because it'll play up for them in their home district prior to an election. We'll have to wait to see. No matter what, I don't think this is going away. This is still developing, it's still ongoing, it's going to carry through till the end of either the presidency or the first term of the presidency, one way or the other. But we're going to move on from Fast and Furious Gate, or again, Executive Privilege Gate to FCC decision gate. It's really not a gate. It's not that big of a deal. But the FCC, excuse me, the Supreme Court did rule recently that the FCC could not impose fines as it had, and I think it dates back to a case seven or eight years ago, as you said earlier, for using profanity on television. I think there are still, first of all, this doesn't mean that everyone's going to start swearing on TV. It doesn't mean Fox people are going to start drawing the F-bombs and you're going to be watching 30 Rock on NBC or ABC, whatever channel's on, and Baldwin's going to be up there saying F this and F that and shit, bitch, whatever other swear words they are. That's not going to happen. But what the Supreme Court essentially did say is there is a freedom of speech. There are opt-out options for these television programs. People can say as they damn well please, within reason, of course. These stations will not run to put more swears in their programming. And I'll tell you what they'll probably do if this FCC ruling continues to degrade the ability of the FCC to monitor content. They will adapt a self-regulating regime similar to movie theaters. What a lot of people don't realize out there is that it's not by law. It's a voluntary it's, rating system. Right. You can't go into the uh, CNR rated movie. It is a voluntary system set up by the Motion Picture Association of America that every movie theater in the country decides to abide by on their own. Hypothetically, you could open a movie theater and not pay attention to the rating system. I don't think that would work. There would be that peer pressure, that industry pressure, et cetera, et cetera, would uh, factor into that quite a bit. But you, in theory, could do that. But they did that in the 60s because they did not want to get regulated by the federal government. So they jumped in and said, hey, we're going to self-regulate to protect ourselves from possible federal regulation, Congress could move to regulate in a certain way swearing on the airwaves. And the way they would do it is likely through FCC licenses or something like that, and they would be determined by a congressional committee, and a station that has a lot of swears 
might just be paying a trillion dollars for their license or something like that. They would find a way to make it so that the stations didn't do it unless they really, really wanted to. But again, I don't think that's going to happen. They'll probably continue to do what they're doing because you got to remember if they do start dropping f bombs and they start getting parents groups out after them and Tipper Gore still gets up there and you know starts complaining about indecency. Is she even still alive? I haven't heard from her for years. Oh, I don't even know if she's alive. Well, I guess we'll have to see. Oh, we'll have to check. any of the uh, viewpoint fact checkers that we get that send us emails. Please find out if Tipper Gore is still alive and what. She I, I assume she is. You're right. I haven't heard from her in years. But anyway, she might get up there and start complaining about indecency like she did with video games 20 years ago. I think that that's what would end up happening. So it's really not a uh, Supreme Gate or FCC Gate. But it was an interesting ruling because the Supreme Court is you know, now seeming to push back in, in affirming freedom of speech. Whether that's indicative of their decisions related to the Arizona immigration law or the Obamacare remains to be seen. But something interesting to, to pay attention to, I wouldn't be surprised if perhaps a Comedy Central or, you know, one of your second or third tier cable stations seeks to loosen the regulations that they use on swearing. I mean... Well, yeah. cable can. You don't have those regulations on cable, nor do you on the Internet. That's why we can allow it on this show. All we do, because we are on iTunes, iTunes, YouTube, different organizations like that or different companies like that, do mandate that you put the explicit tag on a podcast or a video program if it does contain swearing just as a red flag going up saying hey this contains explicit language but it is 100 percent totally legal on right. uh, cable or internet yeah you might start to see that i mean you know some of the cable stations your fx your comedy station they still i mean they don't show hardcore porn or anything yeah like no they, they try to keep it you know somewhat family friendly yeah, but they, it's they, but it's not illegal to curse yeah, and I think they know that if they did go overboard, they'd probably start getting regulated. But what I think you'll see is, you know, your your Comedy Centrals and your stations like that, they'll probably relax a little bit. But again, it'll probably be their later night stuff when they're relaxed as it is. But I will tell you, you watch sometimes a movie on cable, the amount they have to cut out because of the swearing and the inappropriate word, it... it Butchers the movie. Oh, it ruins the whole movie. I, I won't watch a movie if it's rated higher than PG-13, let's say, on broadcast television because you know, they just butcher it. Have you, have you tried to watch Goodfellas on, like, USA or something? Uh, no, uh, no I, I won't because I know what they're like. Uh, amazing movie, but, I mean, and, and I'm not saying they should just play it and let them drop the F-bomb the 73 times a minute they do. But it's like, good God, you, you it's just too much. You're right. You're Every, just, everybody hard. knows of the famous uh, Bruce Willis Die Hard scene on the airport runway. Yeah. It's, like, it's kind of like Schwarzenegger's famous Hostel of Vista line. In the over-the-air broadcast versions of that movie, they replace certain choice words with the word Falcon. F-A-L-C-O-N. Yeah. Yeah. Now, could you imagine every... I'm sure everybody that's listening to this program has watched those Bruce Willis Die Hard movies, and you know his famous phrase that I'm talking about. Yeah. Substitute it with the word Falcon. You just wor yeah, you just ruined the freaking movie. I'm sorry. Exactly. It's, it's a joke. So I think hopefully what you'll see... And, you know, I could see, again, a station like a a USA or something like that, or FX, you know, their Friday or Saturday night movie, putting a little rated R symbol in the right-hand corner... And just letting it go. Not awful, but I think you know, I think that's a good thing because I think that's ultimately better for the market. I mean, pay, and we don't need to get into this argument now. Sure, we're, well, we're using, using myself as the example. I won't watch a movie on broadcast television for just that reason. So your right, broadcast pay, com companies are losing my business because of that. Right. Pay attention to what your kids are watching if you're worried about it. I mean, again, I don't think FX is going to have Goodfellas unedited on at 3 in the afternoon on a Wednesday. They're going to be more... At times more tuned to an adult audience and maybe it's time sure, to they're going to self-police yeah absolutely they are and so i think it's a good thing i think the supreme court made a, the right decision i don't have a problem with the fcc fining stations for indecency but you know that line is tough when it comes to swearing and, and all that jazz but now, what, do, what do you feel then about the infamous wardrobe malfunctions then as opposed to cursing that annoyed me so much. I didn't have a problem with them getting fined. And I think they actually got that money back for it. That's just crappy television production and a crappy show and stupid pop culture and all that. So I didn't have a problem with it personally. Finding somebody for that, I mean, I guess you have to have a fine. Otherwise, you'd have a lot more wardrobe malfunctions. And whether or not it was done on purpose or, or what, I mean, accidents do happen with live television. 
They try to build in a couple second longer loop now so that they can stop it before anything bad happens. But my own opinion on it, I guess it's one of those issues that surprisingly, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm on the fence. I just don't care one way or the other. If they, if they were completely one way or completely the other way, I'd probably be able to live with it. Yeah, I just wanted to cover the wardrobe malfunction since we yeah, were talking about earlier, cursing. The so. whole thing just annoyed me when that happened. And I'm, just, I mean, it was overstated on one side, and on the other side, they probably did it to get attention. So it's just, just a giant nightmare. We're going to move on from FCC Gate to Around the World, our Around the World news section. And I'm just going to bring up art, uh, an article briefly in Argentina. I guess maybe we can call this one Union Gate. The president of Argentina, who's a woman, by the way, has been in the news quite recent, quite a lot recently over some rather strong comments about the Falkland Islands that she's made. Now, that's not actually what this article uh, I'm referring to is about this issue, but she has been drawing a lot of attention and going back and forth with the UK, causing some problems. She's been pretty popular the five years she's been in Argentina now, I think, in power. She's a leftist and has moved the country to the left. You know, Argentina has a lot of currency problems, and they're very funny because they're a South American country, but they're a white South American country. So a unique mix. But anyway, the head of Argentina's most powerful labor union called for a single-day strike by truckers, which is a big, big union in Argentina, and some of the other unions, because they're getting into a fight with the president over their union benefits and their pay raises and whatnot. And I will say, on the one hand, I think they are looking for like a 30% pay raise. I don't know how much they make, what the deal was or whatnot, but what they're looking for, she's not trying to give them, and it's causing a lot of problems. And it's just very interesting that, you know, we often think of labor as being a left-wing issue, and that the left is better for labor than the right, so to speak. Here you have a case in Argentina where you have a leftist in power who has moved her country precipitately much, much further to the left. And somebody who initially supported her five years ago are now clashing with her. And I think it's a case of realism. I hope she's learning. I don't know if she was a rookie when she took over, uh, took office, but... I hope everyone should at least take from this the fact that sometimes it's not simply that right-left divide. And then when you get into the real world, yes, you supported unions, but now they want raises and you need to find the money to pay them. Not as easy as it thinks when you're uh, on the other side of it and you're trying to get their support to vote for you. Hope the president understands that, but hey, what can we do? But nonetheless, always interesting to bring in some news from what's going around the world, uh, what's going on around the world. So labor's not happy here in the United States, and it's not really happy around the end of the world, uh, around the rest of the world. And maybe we're moving towards the end of labor. And, you know, I'm going to throw a little brief discussion in here. A couple weeks ago, Governor Walker in Wisconsin survived his recall. Yes, Ed, he do you did. even remember reading about that in the news? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, they, they barely mentioned it. The, the Occupy movement literally started in the Wisconsin Capitol with him passing this bill to strip union employees of their collective bargaining rights for everything other than their actual salary. And that's really what kicked it off. He went through this whole recall process. This was daily news, the Wisconsin recall, the Wisconsin recall. It was running. He survives the recall, and nothing happened. Bleep of articles for a day. Mainstream media forgot about it the day later. And, I, you know, again, I think that's a little bit disingenuous on their side. But the Supreme Court also ruled recently that you, non-union members in a union shop have to be approached prior to the union raising their dues. So it appears to be a bad year for labor, but maybe that means it's good for the country overall. I wouldn't say there's anti-labor sentiment in the country, but I think people have had enough. And at some point, enough's enough and somebody's got to pay or we've all got to suffer, however you want to phrase it there. But anyway, that's my extended around the world. And as far as I'm concerned, Wisconsin is as foreign as Argentina. So anyway, uh, we're going to move to a brief election update discussion where we're going to talk about the Veep stakes. The Veep stakes, that is the choice for vice president, are heating up. And there's been some talk a lot lately. There's been talk for quite a while about Marco Rubio. But the talk been late, ha, lately has been that he perhaps is not being vetted for vice president. I think that makes sense. And I'll tell you why. He's only been in the Senate for, I think it's two years. It'll actually, I think, be two years. Well, eight. gee, so is our president. You're right, and that was obviously an awful decision. We've seen how only two years in the Senate makes you for makes for an awful president. And he spent those two years running for president, mind you. Yeah. Right. Now, with Rubio, it's, I think, much of the same case. He's only been in the Senate for two years. He doesn't have that federal experience. He's young. He might be a good vice presidential candidate in that sense. He might help with Hispanics. And one of the things I've said before is that even if he could swing 
three or four percent of the Hispanic vote more than Tim Pawlenty, Chris Christie, whoever Mitt Romney picks, that's going to be significant. But I don't know if he's really going to get that. And I don't know if it's worth taking the risk because you're going to have a very inexperienced uh, individual as the vice president. Not to mention Marco Rubio is a conservative Tea Party senator. He could do much, much more for the country and the party by staying a senator for the next six years. Uh, Four years. Sorry, I can do math. And especially the next four years as it goes on, uh, his next election, it's very difficult to unseat a senator. He's going to build up a lot of money, build up a lot of resources. He could, from a party standpoint, it would be much better for him to not be the vice president. I also think at this point, he's probably more of a liability than he is a benefit. And I think people are looking back to Sarah Palin, who was never treated fairly by this country or the media. I think they're saying we've seen what picking somebody who may not be ready for the, that national spotlight can do to the party and can do to that person. Well, ultimately, it was good for her career. But anyway, and I think that's what it is. It, it's just you don't have that time in the national spotlight to really be ready for it, so to speak. So I think they're looking at that not to knock Sarah Palin, but saying, hey, we didn't pick somebody who was as involved, as savvy as we would wanted and I understand John McCain's decision. You want, you know, somebody young and, and, you know, game changer and all that. But ultimately, it partially didn't work. And again, I think it's because of unfairness on the left and in the mainstream media. But I think they're probably looking not to do that. And, you know, Mitt Romney, I don't think he's the most exciting guy in the world. I think he's more of an investment banker. He's more of a share bet kind of guy, which could lead him to pick somebody that might be a little bit on the boring side. But I think his choice is going to be somebody who he knows can pick up the pieces if something were ever to happen to him, which should be the basis for any vice president. I mean, if Mitt Romney got elected and God forbid six months later, he dropped out of a heart attack, which probably won't happen because I think he's in perfect health. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't even drink caffeine. I mean, the guy for a man that's in his early 60s looks phenomenal. If that happened, would you want Marco Rubio being president a year from now? My answer is no. And I think ultimately the country's going to answer no. I hope he doesn't pick somebody too, too boring to end up being uh, his vice presidential candidate. I mean, Tim Pawlenty, I was never a big Pawlenty fan, T-Paw. A lot of people liked him. Um, I think Herman Cain is out, which is disappointing. Uh, Thank God Newt Douchebag Gingrich has dropped off the face of the earth and is hopefully, you know, dying of diabetes somewhere. I think that's about it. I I don't know who he's ultimately going to pick, but I don't think it'll be anyone too shocking. I think you're going to get you're going to get what you'd expect with Mitt Romney, and it's going to be a a Tim Pawlenty-like pick. I don't think he's going to pick your boy Chris Christie. I think that they're going to want to shore up the base. Nah, Chris Christie's done. Yeah, I think they're going to want to shore up the base more. And I think that, you know, Christie may not even really want to do it. I mean, anyone would want to do it, but I think it's, it's not enough of a sure bet that. Well, he never wanted to in the first place. You know, he came right out and said so. Right. I'm, if I'm going to throw the name in the hat that I really think is ultimately going to be his choice. Senator Portman of Ohio. Yeah, you know, people have said that. I just... he, he needs Ohio more than he probably needs almost any state other than Florida. So I would agree with Rubio or Portman because he needs Florida and or Ohio. Yeah, I think he can win in Florida either way. He might do that. I just, and it depends on Portman's popularity in Florida, in, in Florida, yeah, in Ohio. Oh, wow. Well, his popularity in Florida, too, to an extent, but in Ohio... Portman or Teapot, they're just not very exciting candidates to me. And it's funny because I'm the one saying, don't pick an exciting candidate. Don't pick somebody you don't know. But the idea of Senator Rob Portman being the vice president, I don't want to see that guy. I guess here's here's how I look at it. When somebody picks a vice president, I think, do I want to see this person as president someday? Or is this person a Dick Cheney-like, who I would have loved to have seen as president, a Dick Cheney-like character who you know, is at the end of their career and knows it and is just so knowledgeable and so intelligent that you're like, man, if if this person has to take over, that's going to be awesome. Somebody who you knew wouldn't be president, would, but would be awesome as a vice president and would ha- be awesome to take over in a crunch. I mean, I would look at Dick Cheney like that, you know, Al Gore or whatever. But, you know, George H.W. Bush, I think when Reagan was getting elected, you could look at that and say, hey, this is a great guy to be vice president. You know, he could be president someday, and if not, he's still got that. I bet you didn't look at Dan Quayle that way. No, we, whatever happened with that, I don't know. But I guess I really, other than Dick Cheney, have not been happy with a vice presidential choice since 1989. (laughs) So, I mean, what is that? We're going on 22 years. Well, I guess almost half, about a third of the time I've been happy. Joe Biden has been very entertaining, but 
Mr. Obama, you could have done a lot better than Joe Biden. And again, as for Rob Portman, God bless him. Maybe he will be our vice president one day, but I just, to me, there's no sizzle there. I mean, he needs Ohio. Is he that desperate in Ohio? All right, so put it in your little red book or whatever color your book is. I'm going to say either Rubio or Portman. I'll take that. I'll, I'll take the odds on both. I think that's good. I think Teapaw is the other solid option. He's not going to pick Kelly Iote. He's not going to pick the chick from South Carolina there. That's not going to happen. I almost think that Mitt Romney's smart enough that he's not going to pick a woman just because. No, I, I don't think it's going to happen. We just we discussed that at the early stages of our primary coverage. Yeah, it's, I don't think we it, called it the Palin factor. Yeah, it's been stigmatized. The only exception, I think, and it's been shot down many times, but I still think Condoleezza Rice is a possibility. Right, but the, the but, only one that could get away with it, and I've said – a gazillion times he would guarantee himself re-election is if Obama swapped out Biden for Hillary. Yeah, and yeah. and Hillary, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll go on the record with this too. If Obama announced tomorrow that he was going to swap out Biden for Hillary Clinton, he just got himself re-elected. I would say it would, I would probably agree with you, it would make it precipitously more difficult for Romney to overcome that because everyone who didn't like Obama is saying, oh, Hillary's going to be president in four years. That's right. We'll wait for four years of Hillary. Here's something that somebody had advanced, and this would never happen, but this is just going to be, we'll call this a viewpoint hypothetical. Mitt Romney reaches out to Hillary Clinton and says, hey, I want you to be my vice president. Yep. Because I want to move this country forward. I want true bipartisanship. And I want to make a real difference. Oh, that's, that's a great hypothetical. Hillary Clinton says, you know what? I was Secretary of State. I'm stepping down. I'm going to be a vice president on the other ticket. No offense, President Obama, but I'm going to work with Mitt Romney. I'm going to hold his feet to the fire. I'm going to fight and defend liberal bullshit with Mitt Romney. And we're together going to move this presidency forward. Now, that would most definitely be a co-presidency. But it's one of those interesting intellectual exercises to think that that might be one of those things that could move the country forward yep. if, you know, he did pick somebody like Hillary Clinton because she's become, in wake of losing the, the election, she's become a figure that people on the right don't hate as much as they used to. And I think it's because they've seen her tested. They've seen her have some balls. I mean, this woman has I, I think she's one of the best secretaries of state we've probably ever had, period. She is. I mean, she's done good. And, and you know, she's... But Republicans have realized as much as they don't like Democrats, they don't like progressives a whole lot more, and they can work with Democrats. And the Clintons worked with Republicans in the 90s. And, you know, Mitt Romney could say, hey. Hey, our buddy oh. Newt never let us forget that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, Mitt Romney could say, Hillary Clinton is a Democrat, and I'm picking her as vice president because when her and Bill were in the White House, and Bill probably wouldn't like that statement, they worked with a Republican Congress. We need to, I want to work with them. Anyway, I don't think that would actually happen, but it's a very interesting thought because I think it might actually be something where the country could move forward on a lot of things because you could have the vice president and the president really going at it and saying, hey, you know what? We're willing to really compromise. You know, she wants some health care system. Mitt Romney could, I wouldn't say backtrack, but he could do something where he encourages 50 states to do what Massachusetts did, and he's staying true to his principle that the states should decide. Could you imagine turning on mainstream media tomorrow and hearing that the Secretary of State is being vetted, but nobody is saying what she's being vetted for? <laughs> <laughs> that would be wonderful. I, I'd actually, I'd love to see that happening. If she's vetted enough to be Vice President Obama, I mean, I guess that's the other question. How much would Romney need to vet her other than yeah, the right. enough? Right. No, hey, she's already Secretary of State, of course. And, you know, former First Lady. Right. Um, that would be interesting. And that would be a power play by the Clintons that would get them in the history books. I'm going to have to send her a letter. And, and she's too old to serve two terms under Romney and then be president. But you never know. Well, I hey, Rom, I, another thing. Boy, we keep going back to our early primary coverage. I also said in our early primary coverage that one of my qualms with Romney is, is he going to bail out on the country after four years, just like he did Massachusetts? Well, if he had somebody like Hillary as vice president, Romney could just turn around and bail after four years like he did in Massachusetts and give it to Hillary. Yeah, I don't think he will only because you've already, he bailed in Massachusetts because he was going to run for president. He was there to do it and then to get out of there, which the current governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, a raging liberal, I actually liked Deval. 
Um, I do too. He's more and often... and God forbid our president gets reelected. Deval Patrick is definitely yeah, getting general. a cabinet post the next oh, yeah. uh, the next administration. He'll be the attorney general. I guarantee yeah. it. Yep. Um, and I think Deval, from what I've heard, has national aspirations himself. I don't know what his time or tenure would be. In no, but I agree with you. I, I like Deval Patrick. And um, yeah, Attorney General, especially with this whole Holder incident now. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but, one way or another, Patrick would definitely have a cabinet position anyway. Right. But I mean, he, he at least he ran that second term. And if Obama doesn't get elected, I could see Deval sticking around for another term. He might say, hey, I'm going to make my career as a three term governor of Massachusetts. Yeah. And why not do that while you're sticking around? I actually saw – I was actually at a dinner about a month ago that Governor Patrick was at, and he, he spoke, and it was, you know, he was very good. He had a very good speech. I was at his first inauguration. I remember watching that on the news. I was the, home. The one that took place on the, uh, in the front of the state house, and I was, I was there in person. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's – we'll have to see what happens. I think – actually, you know what? Hillary Clinton's 64. So here's the thing. She – if she ran with Romney – and she would still be younger than Reagan four years from now. She would be 72 in eight years. So she could still do it. She could absolutely still do it. At 72, sure. how old was Reagan? 70? 70, yep. Yeah. Okay, so she'd be a little bit older than Reagan. Women generally age better than men do. So, I think, so that's still doable. She could still do it. I think she should. I'm going to send her a letter and say, hey, turn, the, turn this country on its head. I guess I'm always waiting for something to happen that isn't the lesser of you two. Want, yeah, you want radical. You talk radical. You, I, you know, I do, and maybe, maybe that's why I'm destined for academia, but I mean, I would just like something different, something out of the ordinary. We, we always seem to go with the most safest bet possible, you know, and, and unfortunately, you end up with candidates that are just, eh, you know, one's not that much different than the other, and, and the system doesn't get shaken up, and that's not good for our democracy. I know I've said that, but I'm going to have to send her a letter. I think that would really shake things up if uh, her and Romney ran together, and maybe for at least a brief period of time in this country – we would move forward. I, as a conservative, would be willing to concede on some issues if we had a Republican president and a Democratic vice president, if she was willing to get the Democrats to concede on some other things. And I think she could. I'd be willing as a conservative, as a raging right-wing lunatic, not Rush Limbaugh fan conservative, if you had a Romney-Clinton team, Hillary Clinton, I'd be willing to concede on a couple of things. To and get I'll tell you, and one of one of the biggest, strongest points in her favor is she is by no means a dove. She is very strong on oh, the military. No, she's, uh, she's quite the hawk. Hillary would go to war in a heart. Yeah. More of a hawk than Mitt Romney will be. Yeah, she, she's, she's got balls. And I think that's why a lot of people like her is she's got the balls. So anyway, that's my interesting little take on the Veep Stakes. I think you're probably right that it'll be, you know, Portman or Rubio or Teapaw. I'd say those are probably the three top ones. Although, again, I'm, I'm ruling out Rubio because I think that Romney's going to be concerned he's too new. But you never know. You know, he might try to do a game changer. And I think Hillary's not loyal to Obama. Hillary's loyal to the Clinton name and the Clinton mold. And her and Bill would talk and, hey, ultimately, whatever's better, and they're going to jump ship to it. So you never know. You know, she could also wait it out four years. I guess the concern is she, if Obama... It's, it's going to be Hillary 2016, no matter what. You know, if if, if know. Obama gets reelected, she's still going to be there for 2016. And she's... I, I'll tell you, the day Obama wins re-election, should that happen, Hillary is automatically the front runner on the Democratic ticket for 2016. Oh, absolutely. And, and of course, if Obama loses, she's automatically the front runner for 2016. Yeah, I question whether she would want to try to unseat Romney. I mean, she's got a, she's got time to decide. Oh yeah, no, no sure she would. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it, it's 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 tough to unseat a sitting president. I mean, it looks like it might happen in November. But I just I question whether she might want to really do that, or she might just want to wait the four years where she would really be a right. uh, a great right. candidate. And you know, even in twenty twenty, you know, it would be well, who now? We're not necessarily going to pick a Republican. Yeah, at at, at seventy two, as we just yeah, discussed, and, which is and fine. at that point, she's put in her time. But I, I don't think somebody else is going to come and beat her in a primary at that point. But you never do know. I wouldn't be surprised if she became vice president if Obama did get reelected. I don't know if he would want – I don't know if he would necessarily switch prior to the no, election. No, wait till afterwards. Right. And I did say this before that you never know. That could be one of those on Thanksgiving weekend. Oh, you know, Joe Biden resigned and spent time with his family. It's Hillary. Well, by Thanksgiving weekend, it'll be too late. But anyway, you know what I mean? It could happen. But I think the president might be concerned about – the, and, and Hillary would be concerned about the backlash of losing. And the president might be concerned that people will observe it as a political move and see without the value. 
So he might say, no, let's keep things the way they are. And then after the election, six months, eight months down the road, Joe Biden's resigning to spend time with his family. Oh, Hillary, you're the vice president. I could see that being more likely than dumping Biden prior to it. But we'll have to wait and see what happens. But we're going to move on through from the Veep stakes to a more tame full disclosure editorial. All right, BaseNet listeners, what I'm going to talk to you about today is NIMBY. Now, NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y, is an acronym. It's not an official acronym, but it stands for Not In My Backyard. And it's an attitude that a lot of people have towards primarily development, but it could be anything from a, a septic system to a windmill to a Walmart, whatever it is. We all need these things. We all want these things indirectly. But there's an attitude prevalent among people all over this country, especially in Vermont, of not in my backyard. And what that means is that people don't want to live near these developments. Not to say that they move away from them, but that a power company comes in and says, well, we need to lay some lines down here, or we want to build a dam, or we want to build a nuclear power plant. And everyone is up in arms about it. And I'll give you an example. In Burlington, Vermont, they're up in arms about whether or not the Air Force can station the F-35 jet in South Burlington. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the jet has to go somewhere. And I understand there are noise concerns. I understand there are pollution concerns. But just by it not being in your backyard doesn't mean it's not going to happen somewhere. When did we lose our sense of community? We all need energy, but none of us want to live with a power plant nearby. Well, we can't just all build them all in Montana Montana and transfer the electricity around the country. I don't really know why. I'm not a scientist. But everyone just, they don't want anything near them. They don't want to have to deal with this. They don't want their neighbors building a big house. But when they want to go build a big house, they don't want anyone telling them they can't do it. It's time that this country move past this NIMBY attitude that is holding us back. It's holding our economy back. And it's keeping the poor people in this country poor. You don't want it in your backyard. Well, you know what? I don't want an aircraft carrier in my backyard either, but you can bet your ass I want the men and women of the United States Navy and the military defending me. And you know what? Their stuff has to go somewhere. Junkyards have to go somewhere. Power plants have to go somewhere. So the next time you say, I don't want this here, what you're really saying is that you think you're better than other people in the country because it has to go somewhere. And what's worse is you're being a hypocrite And even worse, you're being a big jerk and a big meanie because what you're saying is that you want to use all these nice things. You want to have a power plant. You want to have the U.S. Air Force defending you. You want a place for your trash to go, but you don't want to have to deal with the smell or the sound or the sight. That's for someone else to deal with, like the poor people in working class communities across the country who can't afford to rally and to protest and to attend meetings and to set up websites. You know, get bent is what I have to say. We need to ditch this NIMBY attitude to move this country forward. So to those of you out there who say, not in my backyard, get the hell out of my backyard and go to some other country. That's your full disclosure editorial. I'm Tony Mazzucco. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that uh, most recent show of Viewpoint. I am going to move into our last segment. We always try to close out our uh, shows with something on the lighter side. Ed, have you ever used a juicer before? A juicer, as in you squish your own orange juice? Well, similar to that, but I'm talking about, you know, for instance, the Jack LaLanne power juicer, and I'm endorsing it only because I own one, I guess. But you buy an actual juicer, and then you take, for instance, some apples, and they run through the juicer, and then the juice comes out, and it tastes similar to apple cider, but it's so sweet, and it's so pure, and it just tastes so good because you know it's just natural sugar and just natural goodness in there. And, you know, I had one a couple years ago, and I loved it, and, and it, I went on vacation and tried to take it on vacation, and not all the parts came back, but I bought another one, and it is my favorite thing in the kitchen to use, and I really don't spend much time in the kitchen, but I highly encourage you out there, buy a juicer and start juicing. I prefer the fruits. Again, you throw a couple apples and, and a pear into that thing, and you will have a delicious drink that is out of this world, and it's just the natural juices carrot juice if you juice a bunch of carrots i mean you get this pure bright orange it looks strange carrot thing a couple days ago i did cucumbers and zucchinis uh, cucumbers and tomatoes and i was amazed how much water it separated from the fruit you know from the vegetables well technically they're fruits and it felt like i was drinking a glass of water that came from these fruits uh, and vegetables and it was just amazing so folks buy a juicer start juicing you will not regret it i Garen, guarantee you. My personal recipe favorite is a couple of apples with a pear or two thrown in. But experiment. Do your own thing. 
I highly, highly recommend buying a juicer. Not to mention almost anything you buy off a store shelf is just so high in sodium. You know, I, granted, we need a certain amount of salt in our diet, and I happen to be a well, big you know, fan of salt. Ed, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's not like the salt in the dinner table is the problem. You know, I, and I love you. You get a can of Campbell's soup, a right. little teeny can, and it's like 35 It's or It's a week's pounds. worth of Something salt, of yeah. Egg. Exactly. It's awful. I mean, it, it, I've started to try to look at it because you can't avoid that much sodium. And again, I like salt too. I like when I cook my pasta, I put a little salt in right. the water. But, ta but table salt, like you said, not not these products off the shelf being 90% sodium. sodium. You know, yeah. yeah, you're right. And that's the problem is it's so easy to hit that 100% level. It'd be one thing if all the, you know, these cans of soup and even you, you buy a cookie, a, a Celeste pizza, any of these things, it'd be one thing if they had 5 or 10% of your daily total. But on average, these things have 30 or 40%. Yeah. I used to work with somebody who the individual bought those smart ones, healthy dinners all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, those are supplements. Those are designed for you to eat two or three times a week in lieu of an 1,800-calorie meal. But she would have one every day. Those are half of your sodium for the day. Little tiny meal, half the salt you should be having in a day. You know, What if you have something salty? I mean, even Cheerios has like 8 or 9% of the freaking sodium you're supposed to have for a day. So, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, and that's another way to, that, that, you know, the juicer is great. And what I'm going to start doing, because I prefer my coffee in the morning with cream and sugar, I can deal with equal, and I can deal with half and half. I can't always deal with uh, skim milk, though, rather. I can't always deal with them together, but I think I like to put cream into the coffee to cool it down more than anything. So what I think I'm going to start doing is juicing some fresh apple juice at the start of the day or start of the week, putting it in a squirt bottle and squirting in a couple tablespoons – because that'll get me the sugar, which there's, is you know, there's your natural. more natural sugar, right? Exactly. So it's not like it's just you know you're you're out of the jar sugar, and it'll help cool the coffee down a little bit and give it a nice little apple flavor. I'm gonna try that instead of milks and creams. I'm gonna try doing some apple juice and some pear juice and stuff. Hey, like make that. sure you let us all know how that worked out. Maybe I, uh, we'll all start trying that. Yeah, I will. I think I'm gonna try. I want to say next week because I'm almost out of my skim milk for the week. So I think next week is when I'm gonna wanna. You know, get a little squirt ketchup bottle type thing of apple juice and squirt it in my coffee and see how good it is. And it's all natural, so I'm not worried about it being too sweet. I don't have to fight that battle of do I want a third spoon of sugar or do I not want that spoon, third spoon of sugar. But anyway, on the lighter side, folks, buy a juicer and start experimenting. And I will get back to you in the next episode of Viewpoint about my soon-to-be apple-sweetened coffee and how it worked out. That being said, we thank you once again, as always, for listening. And we encourage you to check out all the programming at Basenet.com. Find us all over Facebook, social, all over social media, Facebook, the Twitter, and we hope you keep listening. We hope to hear from you soon.